So um, today we're starting a new series about the four shields, the initiations of the sacred human. And as you might have guessed, the first one is the child. And so we'll go into that in a little bit more detail, um, but I would like to just kind of introduce you to the basic wheel, the human mandala is a way of thinking of this. It's sort of a map of, of where we go as divine human beings in each of these stages and how the stages, one kind of initiates the next stage. I mean, the whole thing is really cast in a rite of passage. The whole thing is cast in this idea of initiation. And so that's going to make a little bit more sense as we go along. But I want to tell you a little bit about the experience I had this week. I was on a retreat. Thank you to our very thoughtful board that made that a, a reality as a part of my work here to take quarterly spiritual retreats that really feed my soul and hopefully bring forth something to share. And um, this week was this really great combination because I was both in the redwoods and walking the beach, and then I also was at a meditation retreat at Spirit Rock. And I know, right? Mm, just love it here. Just really love it here. <laughs> that these things are at our fingertips is like, wow, so amazing. So here's one of the most amazing experiences. I was walking along the beach and alongside the beach are, is a pair of elephant seals. And I go a little further, and there's an entire tribe. I think they call them herds or pods. But anyway, there was a lot of them. And, um, you know, it's one of those things when we are in the company of wild animals, right? It's one thing to kind of view them from somewhere, but here, the, here I am, you know, right? Quite, quite near them, and I know it's good not to be too quick, too near them, so I, I couldn't back up too far unless I wanted to swim, and it was pretty cold, so, <laughs> so I was on the edge of the ocean, but they were all sleeping, you know, and if you know a little bit about their rhythms, they apparently go out and, and swim very, very long distances and feed, and then they come, and they are really beached sleeping for quite a while um, before mating. And so they were all sleeping except this one enormous elephant seal who's, you know, was facing, so, so she was sort of on her belly and her head toward the sea. And she lifted up her head and those big, enormous black eyes with the long lashes watched me. I mean, it was the most incredible experience. And I was kind of like, OK, well, I don't want to make too much a big deal out of it, but it's a pretty big deal. You know, so there was just this great, you know, in the moment. And, and what happens when we have these amazing experiences is we are so fully in the moment, right? I mean, I was not think I had might have been walking and thinking about something just prior, but all I could think about was this elephant seal and this relationship. And there's like that tinge of fear, because you know, you're in the presence of a lot of wild animals, and they're big, and I've seen them be aggressive, so, you know, and then, but then there's that oh, wonder, you know. I couldn't have been more, even as I was walking, sort of planted on the earth, feeling my bare feet on the sand and the water, and that, you know, just really present to the sensual experience as well as the heart experience, the soul experience. So the next day, I'm at Spirit Rock on an insight meditation retreat. And one of the questions, it was kind of, there was some question and answer and work with people in the audience as well. And this young woman raises her hand. And I would guess she's probably at her first job, maybe a couple of years into it. And she says, you know, I, I come here and I feel so different, you know, when we, especially when we go on the walking meditations. And she said, but my day-to-day -day life, you know, I work at this startup in San Francisco, and she said, I have a very tiny office and a small desk, that no windows. And she said, I just feel so confined, you know? And of course, she's probably working very long hours and commuting, and, and you could just almost, I could almost hear the subtext of her question was, is this what it means to be a grown-up, right? I'm now in the working world. Is this what it means to be a successful professional? That I have to sort of confine myself in this cage-like indoor environment, you know? And I know I experienced that as a young woman too, just starting out in office work, and I've heard other uh, young people express that kind of that sense of 
soul-sucking you know, kind of experience, right? So here's these two juxtaposed experiences, you know, and it reminds me of, of, of what this, this work is about that we're about to leap into, which is that finding that holistic, balanced understanding of who we are as a divine human being. What does it mean to be a responsible adult? And does that mean we have to chuck away the wildness and the awe and the wonder of being a child so connected to the natural world or so connected to the fun and the play of life, the freedom that we just spoke of? And, and what does it mean to be that sort of in that sometimes gloomy or dark or difficult stage of passage from childhood to adulthood that we call adolescence. Or to enter then from, uh, from our adulthood and our elderhood into that life transition into the full spirit world. And then to enter back into the wheel again, which is what we've just done, by the way, having just last week resurrected, right? Having been all about the spirit and the resurrection of spirit that's very east the East Shield of these four shields that we're going to talk about is all about spirit, is about springtime. It's sunrise. The shield of the East, one of the four directions, one of the seasons, one of the uh, stages of us as a divine human, part of that map. And so we really, though, begin, and, and I know there are many wheels of life around the world and many out of many indigenous cultures in particular, these kinds of maps of, of our holistic path have emerged. And so you may be familiar with other kinds of wheels of life or medicine wheels that have different names for different directions. So this is the one that I was taught. Uh, this comes out of um, Stephen Foster and Meredith Little's work and um, the rites of passage work that they started in Big Pine, and now they have the School of Lost Borders there. And I have been a student of theirs. I never got to meet Stephen because he made his transition, but I've been a student of the work there and, and a guide of the work there as well since then. And so this has been a really meaningful and useful path to me to sort of bridge my understanding of what it means to have this cerebral transcendent kind of spiritual experience like the meditation retreat and the earthy kind of connected relational body present moment childlike nature indigenous understanding kind of experience like the one of walking the beach and experiencing that elephant seal and both are equally spiritual and both are equally important i think uh, to our walk to our holistic understanding of who we are. So Stephen's, uh, Stephen and Meredith wrote this, but I think Stephen was the primary author. And um, he says this about kind of how we maybe, and he doesn't really even go into how we went off track, but we kind of have been gotten off track, right? A little bit, like the young woman's story, right? And so he talks about how primitive people, um, as we have called them over the years, or people who have lived closer to the earth, have sort of not lost this holism. And so he says, although the origins of the big lie, and when he refers to the big lie, you know, I've, I've often talked about the, you know, we don't say sin too much um, because we don't really align with sin in the way we've understood it through traditional Christianity, but we know sin just means missing the mark. And so if there's a, the biggest mistake or the biggest sort of missing the mark for us is, is the idea that we're separate. Right? And that's the big lie he's referring to. This big lie that we are somehow separate from, from spirit, separate from the earth, separate from each other. So although the origins of the big lie are too complex, he says, to address here, the fact is that somewhere along the way, our ancestors gradually lost the tendency to grow into the full maturity of human nature. Our development was arrested at some point between childhood and adolescence, and we found ourselves on a detour in the developmental process. It has resulted in a loss of our relationship to the four faces of nature. We stopped growing into full adulthood. We stopped taking responsibility for the condition of the earth and of ourselves. We, as the centuries pass, the illusion that we are separate from nature and at war with our own essential nature grew stronger 
even as we grew more childlike, more dependent on the technobiotic womb that promised safety and security from the howling cold. He says when we take this view, it's more about I have and that it has gradually replaced I live. I have has become more important than I live. So that's the bad news. <laughs> what the good news is, there's a map. There's a way through. There's an understanding available to us. You know, in our culture, typically, most of us have experienced in our culture, not a lot of ritual or rite of passage at significant times in our lives. And in indigenous cultures, to, to some degree, in the Jewish culture with the bar mitzvah, and, and other ways, you know, there is some of this in our culture, but there is a real lack of ritual and rite of passage at these very significant times, particularly the passage from the south shield, which is the child, and the, we the uh, west shield, which is the adolescent, into the north shield, that is the adult. So it's that passage of childhood into adulthood that our children don't get initiated by we, the elders, and we ourselves have never maybe been initiated as, as full women or men or adults in whatever ways that we describe ourselves. And so this, this work allows us and invites us into rites of passage, passage and ritual that we can create for ourselves and come to understand where we may be not completely initiated, where we may be a bit stuck in one shield, one may be overemphasized, another may be a little weaker. And so it gives us a map to look at ourselves and to walk this walk of holism, of what it really means to be an embodied spiritual being, to be both in it, to be reaching in the direction of sky and, and reaching down into the core of earth. So both bring us this kind of balance. So Alan Watts says in, in his book, This Is It, which this is it to me. <laughs> he really encapsulates it. He says, is it not possible to be a mystic and a sensualist without actual contradiction? That the love of nature and the love of spirit are paths upon a circle which meet at their extremes. Perhaps the meeting is discovered only by those who follow both at once. And to that I say, amen. <laughs> because it is both of those paths that really allow us to converge in the wholeness I think that we were created to be. You know, the out of the earth idea that we were made, you know, even if that's a myth, there's still a real truth to that, isn't there? Because this body is of the earth, is, is, is of that materiality and that physicality. Years ago, I remember somebody saying, you know, um, or maybe I read it, when um, particularly women, men may say this too, but you know how women sometimes say, I love those shoes. You know, it's an odd use of the word love, isn't it? I love those. I love that dress. I love that, you know, so I don't, I, you know, and I don't want to stereotype men and women. You know, you, you may say that about your shoes too, men, or other things. I don't know. Uh, I love the shirt, right? I, I, I love my golf clubs, whatever it may be. <laughs> we all got to love something, right? But isn't it interesting, and you know, and so anyway, this, this author, and I wish I could remember who it was, it went, as soon as I think of it, I'll give them credit, her, I think it was a her. Um, but anyway, um, that, that, that love, that love for the material thing is actually a love for nature, right? Because that thing is made of nature. And so it's sort of our modern way of reaching into that longing and that desire to be back in that place of natural rhythm. Isn't that lovely? It's a lovely way to recast that. So it doesn't make us bad or wrong. It makes us recognize that we have desire and that our modern ways have br brought up that desire in, in new and different ways. So, so to just give you kind of the lay of the land of this mandala, this four shields, 
The first shield, as I mentioned, is the child. So we come into this world as, of course, the child, right? As the newborn and then who develops into the child. And so in the South Shield, it is everything child. You know, it's summertime, it's midday, it's sunshine, it's play, it's sensuality, it's discovering of the body, it's sexuality. And all of these things, you know, that children are so good at. You know, the other day I came home, Brenly had been spending time with Grace, as she often does. And I said, what'd you do? And she said, oh, you know, she named some things. But the thing that really stood out to me was she said, well, Grace discovered an ant, and she allowed the ant to crawl on her arm for quite some time until the ant disappeared, and then she got a little freaked out and didn't know where the ant had gone. <laughs> But I thought, you know, here's, so in a day of life, I don't usually talk about how I allow the ant to crawl, but I was thinking about that as a child. Remember that? Do you remember that when you were first discovering little things that crawled upon the earth and how curious it was to feel that thing crawl upon your skin or to watch it on your hands? And, and so we, we've in some ways lost a bit of that edge, right? But when we enter the South Shield, we re-enter with a sort of, uh, we can, if we, if we do this deliberately, enter again with the eyes of a child and the experiences of a child. And we can shed those old things that we heard about how the flesh is, you know, sinful and corrupt and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Let that go, right? Because all that we know is not truth, right? Because we know when we're in the field of truth and when we're not. You know, and so once we, we come into the aliveness of truth, we realize, ah, sexuality and spirituality don't have to be complete polar opposites, right? There is a place for, for all of these to converge together in beautiful ways. So as we engage our sensuality, we, we bring all five senses into the bedroom, or we bring all five senses out to play in our backyards, in our gardens, or at the ocean, or amongst the redwoods, or wherever it is that, that turns you on, you know, in that turns, turns up the volume of the spirit as an embodied being. It's a gift. It's a great gift we've been given to walk the earth as an embodied being. You know, and, and usually what, for, you know, several, maybe 10 decades, who knows, maybe more. But, you know, it's, it's relatively not a huge amount of time when you cast it in the spectrum of evolution. And so it's, it's a time to really savor this experience of being an embodied spiritual being. So, so in the South, that's, that's, and we'll go back, we'll go into this a little bit more, but I just want to give you the whole wheel. So the child then becomes the adolescent, right? In the West, the adolescent. You could think of caves and darkness, you know? <laughs> it's sort of that time of, I'm not, I'm in a kind of starting to become an adult body, but I still feel like a kid, right? I still live at mom and dad's and they still guide things and I'm not yet responsible. So it's that awkward sort of experience and that's a big initiatory time for us. In a lot of ways, our collective culture is still stuck in the child in ways that aren't so healthy because we have so many uninitiated adults <laughs> running the world. <laughs> <laughs> And so, so you can see it, and you can, we can see it in our own lives, and we can see it in our collective society, where, how important it is to walk the wheel, to really take it seriously, to really allow ourselves to move through these spaces that are so significant. And so in the, in the West, we have sunset, and we have fall, the season of fall. And when we move to the North, to the adult, it's winter time, and it's a time of service and parenthood and work and responsibility, all the responsibilities that come with work and family and sort of being the head of the tribe or one of, one of the heads anyway, uh, one of the leaders who is the responsible one, right? Um, and so I loved in the song that Jabari sang where he talked about um, the perfectionism idea or the, you know, how it sort of squelches the child or the worry wart. You can see how if you've got an overdeveloped north, which many of us do, I certainly can relate to that, then, then the child doesn't sort of get that freedom of play so much because there's sort of that Oh, that sort of, you know, it's got to be this way. It's about chronos time. It's about clock and calendar and things to do and stuff's got to get done and this is serious business, right? So we need the adult, but it can be a little too much too. 
So we can get stuck in one of the shields. So this is another way to look at it is where am I overemphasized and where am I underemphasized? And how can I draw out a little bit more of that other uh, shield that hasn't gotten so much play? And then, of course, in the East, then it's pure spirit, it's springtime, it's sunrise, it's first light. It's the transition of, of our bodies into full spirit and then back again to be children again. So here we are in the South as a child. And as I mentioned, it's about body, it's about sensuality, it's about play. And, you know, one of the things that um, is interesting about children is, you know, they know they know like the places they play really well. There's a locality, a kind of depth of locality. So a child knows the backwoods that they grew up in really well, like way better than most adults would ever pay attention to, right? Because again and again, they repeatedly go to those places to spend time, to listen, to interact, to play. They know how the ground feels, the ground of that locality. And there is sensuality has that locality to it. You know, kids may know the, the driveway or the, or the sidewalks if they're in a more city dwelling, but there's still that sense of place. And that's a part of this childlike sensuality, that there's a real sense of place. David Abram is an ecologist, and he says in his book, Spell of the Sensuous, this about this idea. In contrast, he says, to the apparently unlimited global character of the technologically mediated world, the sensuous world, the world of our direct interactions, is always local. The sensuous world is the particular ground upon which we walk, the particular air that we breathe. And so one of the ways that we can really enter this South Shield and play, if you will, in it this week <laughs> is to become a much more aware of the ground upon which we walk. Like, What is it like in your backyard or front yard or places you traverse? Is it like, like a lot of pine needles or acorns or dry earth or, you know, what does it feel like? Do you ever walk on it barefoot? You know, do you know the ground upon which you are dwelling, upon which you walk each day? Do you know it like a child would know it, to play and interact with it? And maybe if you're a gardener, you do. Maybe you dig in that soil a lot and you have that kind of sense of earthy connection. That's one of the ways that adults often have that connection again with earth and child. But also to bring the playfulness, you know, like maybe running the sprinkler on a warm day in the backyard or, you know, or, or go naked in your backyard, you know. <laughs> that sounds fun to me. I had a friend that told me that her, that's what her husband did every day. I don't know why she told me because it was just like forever. That's all I could think about, you know. Every time I saw him, I'm like, Brian, yeah. <laughs> that one's for you, Michelle. <laughs> I know she watches a lot. <laughs> so, oh, now that I named their names, I don't feel like I can tell this story. <laughs> Darn it. Those weren't their real names, though. <laughs> I'll, take, I'll take the risk. I'll take the wrath of, of Brian and Michelle. Anyway, she, she was just telling me how he loved to, he had target, like a target thing? I don't know, bow and arrow, I guess. I'm not sure. Some kind of target practice that he would do yeah so anyway he and that's how he spent his mornings naked in the backyard with target practice and I thought how fabulous you know I had another friend Arlene and I didn't realize that she was connected to this guy who looked like father time I mean he had the longest beard and this long hair and I would see this man I mean he was probably in mid 70s at least by then and at Unity Village he would skip everywhere he went so I would see this man, like I'd be in class, and it's like, oh, there's Father Time skipping across <laughs> the Rose Garden, you know? I mean, literally, he would skip long distances from the parking lot to this place to that place. And then I finally met Arlene. She, oh, it's Chris Christopher. That's my husband. I was like, how delightful is he? I mean, he's just like this child old man. I, she said, exactly. <laughs> But you know, it's that kind of playfulness. You know, the Dalai Lama brings that. 
And um, uh, Trudy and um, Jack Cornfield, who were the teachers of our retreat, um, they're married, and they were telling about their experiences with the Dalai Lama. He, he kidded about it, like, you know, yeah, the day, the day with the Dalai Lama is a pretty good day. <laughs> And so these meditation teachers had gathered in Dharamsala, where, of course, the Dalai Lama lives, and, and, they, and, and Trudy was just describing how his humor is just very in the moment. It's not about, like, he's memorized jokes or something, you know? It's just, it's very spontaneous, and, and he just makes joy out of everyday things. So she said every morning he would go a long distance through a lot of people who were, you know, wanting to see him or catch eyes with him. They were standing at the you know, outside the fence, and, and he would have to go a long way from the place where he was lodging to where they were going to have some teachings and sharings in the temple. And she said he'd finally get there, and he'd say something like, how'd you all sleep? You know, very familiar, you know? It was like, I, I don't have to do all this, you know, sort of pomp and circumstance, right? It was very real. And they would, you know, all mumble their answers, and he would say, I slept nine hours. Ha, 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 I feel great, you know? But it's just like that kind of, you know, just bringing some joy. And, and for, she described, you know, and I know this, but the way she described it really brought me to that, the weight of the world that he holds, you know, as a spiritual leader of our world. And the, and the pain of, you know, places like Syria and Yemen that he talked about. And he said, don't forget about these places, you know. And, and, and so it's like that kind of person who's holding that kind of consciousness for our entire world. She said every time they, the teachers would bring up something specific about a specific place that they were talking about, he would interrupt and he would move it to the whole world because that's his view, right? That's what he's holding. He's holding us all in this sort of, this, this beautiful way. And he and Desmond Tutu also, who has seen and experienced horrific things amongst his people, the two of them got together and wrote the book of joy. And you see them laughing together, right? You know, so there's like the depth of what a spiritual being can hold, the seriousness in the north shield of the responsibility and the east shield of the spirit can, can be tempered with this beautiful south shield, this child, this joy, this play. In fact, it needs to be, right? Don't we all need to lighten up? I know I do. Doesn't the world need some of that joy and that playfulness? And so the South Shield has those gifts to offer us. And ways that we can enter it and interact with it is to just look at the elements of it. So, so the literal element of it is water. And so interacting with water, thinking about how water moves and flows and is flexible. It could be rushing and hard and roaring and big waves, and it can be solid and placid. And, and, and you know, so, so that... that flexibility, that movement, also that water is a place of recreation, right? A place to, to play and cleanse. It's a place of pleasure for the body. So all of those things, entering the sensuality, doing things that engage all five senses, and, and thinking about that in a real literal way. Oh, okay, I can smell the flowers, and I see the beautiful colors, and, you know, I hear the songs of the birds, and, you know, I'm tasting some delicious fruit. You know, one of the things that happens on these meditation retreats is I'm always brought back to that mindful eating practice that I forget, it seems, uh, pretty much as soon as I walk out the door of the retreat. But then I try to reel myself back in, and I don't know if any of you have, have practiced this, but, you know, when you, I notice that whenever I do really mindful, slow down eating, I notice what a difference between different foods so in my lunch every day, I had like carrots and hummus, but I also had these crackers and, you know, just kind of a, a array of snacky-like foods. But I would bite into that carrot in a mindful way, and wow, was it alive. I mean, it was so alive and juicy and, you know, quenching of thirst and sweet. And then I would bite a cracker, and it was like dead. Like, this is like dead food, you know, because it's been processed so much, right? So as we slow down and we get mindful, this is one of the ways that we can engage our senses is to notice those things or whatever it will be for you that comes up. Maybe you'll have a different aha. But so, so with food and with, and with play and with um, our, our time, allowing ourselves to, to be free, to be free.
is really what it's about, isn't it? So if we, if, um, one of the other aspects of this shield that I think is really important is the body. Because, oh, have we not been so hard on our bodies? It's, it's, it's sad and painful to think about it, really. Um, what we do as a culture, you know? So the ideal that's held for us all is sort of the Hollywood celebrity, the, as Eckhart Tolle says, the glossy people in the glossy magazines, you know? It's like everything is airbrushed and, you know, tucked and whatever, you know? You, I don't need to tell you about our culture. We know it well, right? So, so there's that sort of ideal that's set up, and then there's the realness of who we are. And if we can only jump out of that mindset that says our bodies need to be a certain way or to be critical of our bodies and instead jump into that very natural, relaxed, sort of belly relaxed space, you know? So Clarissa Pincola Estes wrote Women Who Run With the Wolves quite a while ago. And in it, she tells a story about how she and her friend Opalanga, who's an African-American woman, and um, as Clarissa Pincola describes herself, I am una Mexicana. <laughs> and she said they did this tandem storytelling um, program called Body Talk. And in it, they tell the stories of how their bodies were criticized and ways that they kind of received slings and arrows over the years about how they were not beautiful or they were not this enough or that enough. And Opalanga tells a story of how she's a very tall, thin um, African-American woman with a space between her teeth. And so it, it, she wasn't really, ex you know, her body wasn't really acceptable in her culture. And, the, and she was told that the space between her teeth was uh, a bark of a liar. And so that was one of the many things that they talked about is they danced and they mourned and told these stories of body. And so Clarissa says, in her own words, I'm low to the ground and extravagant of body. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, so in the American culture, I didn't fit the description of, of the they, right? The, the, the imposed they, whatever, whoever they are that think this, should, this is the standard. And so she talked about that experience. But then Opalanga says, yes, but Clarissa, you know what happened? She said, one time I went to Gambia, West Africa, and there I found tall, thin-bodied people. Tall as a yew tree with spaces between their teeth, <laughs> their front tooth. And she said, and the people told me that space between my tooth I got to get, get it right, what it's called. Called a Sakaya Yala, the opening of God, a sign of wisdom. And Clarissa said, well, guess what? I went to Mexico. <laughs> and everybody there said, honey, you're so skinny. Why don't you eat more? <laughs> Something wrong? Are you sick? <laughs> Women are la tierra. They are the earth. They're meant to be low to the ground because they hold everything like the earth. Isn't that beautiful? And so that reclaiming, that reclaiming, and it's not just women, men too, I know. We all do it to ourselves and each other, right? And so it's that reclaiming of loving our bodies as they are, just loving them, really loving them. You know, you can even do a meditation where you just do that, a loving kindness kind of meditation in Buddhism called metta practice, just for your body. Love your head and your shoulders and love your, your breasts, your chest, your, you know, every aspect of body. Just go through the different aspects of body, loving each one. It's a beautiful gift that we give to ourselves, that we give to the earth, and it's a real south shield kind of uh, bringing the adult back into the child, really. And in some ways, our initiations may not be complete for whatever reasons, because maybe our innocence was stolen as a young child, or maybe we were uh, you know, the big sister or the big brother who took care of all the other kids and didn't really get to be a child, or mom or dad were absent in some way, or maybe we were a child who didn't get to feel our feelings. I mean, we all have got 
aspects of the child that have not gotten to be fully experienced. And so I guess what I'm encouraging you to do is, if you need to write yourself a permission slip to be <laughs> a child this week, to play, to be in joy, to be in sensuality, to be in the rediscovery and the honoring of the body temple. And to let that the inner child that we begin to reconnect with during our meditation lead the way. Befriend that child again. You know, and you may find when you go into your meditation, or maybe you have already found that that child is hiding somewhere. So it may take a little coaxing because the relationship has been estranged. To bring that child forward to develop that connection and trust again, and then let that child take you out to play. Anybody ever read Julia Cameron's Artist Way? I mean, it's been a long time, but Julia Cameron has written several books on on art. And uh, what she talks about in the artist way is going on artist dates. And so what I want to suggest to you is go on play dates with your, your inner child. Let your inner child lead the way. You know, I want to go to the beach. I want to go to the woods. I want to build fairy houses. I want to draw pictures, listen, you know, play music, dance, whatever it is that your child wants. You know, you might end up in the mud naked. I don't know. <laughs> it happens. It's been known to happen. <laughs> but what fun, right? What fun we can have with this. So, so let's do that. Let's have fun. Let's befriend that child. Let's go out and play. And let's affirm that together. Together, I befriend the child within me. And we go out to play. Amen. Amen.